Welcome back, everyone. Uh, today we are reading chapters 31 and 32. Um, only two more episodes left of the series, so uh, let's get into it. Chapter 31, The Treasure Hunt, Flint's Pointer. Jim, said Silver, when we were alone, if I saved your life, you saved mine, and I'll not forget it. I seen the doctor waving you to run for it, with the tail of my eye I did, and I seen you say no as plain as hearing. Jim, that's one to you. This is the first glint of hope I had since the attack failed, and I owe it to you. And now, Jim, we're to go in for this here treasure hunting, with sealed orders too, and I don't like it. And you and me must stick close, back to back like, and we'll save our necks in spite of fate and fortune. Just then a man hailed us from the fire that that breakfast was ready, and we were soon seated here and there about the sand over biscuit and fried junk. They had lit a fire fit to roast an ox, and it was now grown so hot that they could only approach it from the windward, and even there not without precaution. In the same wasteful spirit they had cooked, I suppose, three times more than we could eat, and one of them, with an empty laugh, threw what was left into the fire, which blazed and roared again over the unusual fuel. I never in my life saw men so careless to the morrow. Hand to mouth is the only word that can describe their way of doing. And what with wasted food and sleeping centuries, though they were bold enough for a brush and be done with it, I could see their entire unfitness for anything like a prolonged campaign. Even Silver, eating away with Captain Flint upon his shoulder, had not a word of blame for their recklessness. And this the more surprised me, for I thought he had never shown himself so cunning as he did then. Aye, mates, said he, it's lucky you have barbecue to think of you with this here head. I've got what I wanted, I did. Sure enough, they have the ship. Where they have it, I don't know yet. But once we hit the treasure, we'll have to jump about and find out. And then, mates, us that has the boats, I reckon, has the upper hand. Thus he kept running on, with his mouth full of the hot bacon. Thus he restored their hope and confidence, and, I more than suspect, repaired his own at the same time. As for hostage, he continued, that's his last talk, I guess, with them he loves so dear. I've got my piece of news, and thank you to him for that, but it's over and done. I'll take him in, in a line when we go treasure hunting, for we'll keep him like so much gold in case of accidents. You mark, and in the meantime. Once we got the ship and treasure both, and off to sea like jolly companions, why, we'll, why then we'll talk Mr. Hawkins over, we will, and we'll give him his share, to be sure, for all his kindness. It was no wonder the men were in, in a good humor now. For my part, I was horribly cast down. Should the scheme he had now sketched prove feasible, Silver already doubtedly a traitor, would not hesitate to adopt it. He had still a foot in either camp, and there was no doubt he would prefer wealth and freedom with the pirates to a bare escape from hanging, which was the best he had to hope for on our side. Nay, and even if things so fell out that he was forced to keep his faith with Dr. Livesey, even when what danger lay before... Nay, and even if things so fell out that he was forced to keep his faith with Dr. Livesey, even then what danger lay before us? What a moment that would be when the suspicions of his followers turned to certainty, and he and I should have to fight for dear life, he a cripple, and I a boy, against five strong and active seamen. Add to this double apprehension the mystery that still hung over the behavior of my friends, their unexplained desertion of the stockade, their inexplicable uh, session of the, sh of the chart, or harder still to understand the doctor's last warning to Silver, 
Look out for squalls when you find it. Then you will readily believe how little taste I found in my breakfast, and with how uneasy a heart I set forth behind my captors on the quest for treasure. We made a curious figure, and anyone been there to see us, had anyone been there to see us, all in soiled sailor clothes, and all but me armed to the teeth. Silver had two guns slung about him, one before and one behind, besides the great besides the great cutlass at his waist and a pistol in each pocket of his square-tailed coat. To complete his strange appearance, Captain Flint sat perched upon his shoulder and gabbling odds and ends of purposeless sea talk. I had a line about my waist and followed obediently after the sea cook, who held the loose end of the rope, now in his free hand, now between his powerful teeth. For all the world, I was led like a dancing bear. The other men were variously burthened, some carrying picks and shovels, for that had been the very first ne necessary they brought ashore from the Hispaniola, others laden with pork, bread, and brandy for the midday meal. All the stores, I observed, came from our stock, and I could see the truth of Silver's words the night before. Had he not struck a bargain with the doctor, and he and his mutineers, deserted by the ship, must have been driven to, subs to subsist on clear water and the proceeds of their hunting. Water would have been little to their taste. A sailor is not usually go a good shot, and besides all that, when they were so short of eatables, it was not likely they would be very flush of powder. Well, thus equip uh, equipped, we all set out, even the fellow with the broken head, who should certainly have kept in shadow, and straggled, one after another to the beach, where the two gigs awaited us. Even these bore trace of the drunken folly of the pirates, one in a broken thwart, and both in their muddy and unbailed condition. Both were to be carried along with us for the sake of safety, and so, with our numbers divided between them, we set forth upon the bosom of the anchorage. As we pulled over, there was some discussion on the chart. The Red Cross was, of course, far too large to be a guide, and the terms of the note on the back, as you will hear, admittedly, uh, admitted of some ambiguity. They ran, the reader may remember, thus. Tall tree, spyglass shoulder, Bearing a point to the north of North Northeast, Skeleton Island, East Southeast, and by East, ten feet. A tall tree was thus the principal mark. Now, right before us, the anchorage was bounded by a plateau from two to three hundred feet high, adjoining on the north. On the north, the sloping southern shoulder of the spyglass, and rising and rising again towards the south into the rough, cliffy eminence called the Mizzenmast Hill. The top of the plateau was dotted thickly with pine trees of varying height. Every here and there, one of a different species rose forty or fifty feet clear above its neighbors, and which of these was the particular tall tree of Captain Flint could only be decided on the spot and by the readings of the compass. Yet, although that was the case, every man on board the boats had picked a favorite of his own his own ear. We, we, ere we were, halfway over, Long John alone shrugging his shoulders and by, bidding them wait till they were till they were there. We pulled easily by Silver's directions, not to weary the hands prematurely, and after quite a long passage, landed at the mouth of the second river, th that wit second river, that which runs down a woody cleft of the spyglass. Thence, bending to our left, we began to ascend the slope towards the plateau. At the first outset, heavy, miry ground and a matted 
miry ground and a matted marsh vegetation greatly delayed our progress but by little and little the hill began to steepen and become stony underfoot and the wood to change its character and to grow in a more open order it was indeed a most pleasant portion of the island that we were now approaching a heavy scented broom and many flowering shrubs had almost taken the place of grass thickets of grass nutmeg trees were dotted here and there with the red columns and the broad shadow of the pines and the first mingled their spi their spice with the aroma of the others the air besides was fresh and stirring and this under the sheer sunbeams was a wonderful refreshment to our senses the party spread itself abroad in a fan shape shouting and leaping to and fro about the sh uh, about the center in a good way but behind the rest silver and i followed i tethered by my rope he plowing with deep pants along among the sliding gravel from time to time indeed i had to lend him a hand or he must have missed his f footing and fallen backward down the hill we had thus proceeded for about half a mile and were approaching the brow of the plateau when the man upon the farthest left began to cry aloud as if in terror shout after shout came from him and the others began to run in his direction he can't have found the treasure said old morgan hurrying past us from the right for that's clean atop indeed as we found when we when we also reached the spot it was something very different at the foot of a very pretty uh of a very pretty at the foot of a pretty big pine and involved in a green creeper which had even partly lifted some of the smaller bones a human skeleton lay with a few shreds of clothing on the ground i believe a chill struck for a moment to every heart he was a seaman said george mary who bolder than, than the rest had gone up close and was examining the rags of clothing leastways this is good sea cloth ay ay said silver like enough you wouldn't look to find a bishop here i reckon but what sort of a way is this it is that for bones to lie taint it taint in nature indeed on a second glance it seemed impossible to fancy that the body was in a natural position but for some disarray the work perhaps of the birds that had fed upon him or the slow-growing creeper that had gradually enveloped his remains the man lay perfectly straight his feet pointing in one direction his hands raised above his head like a diver's pointing directly in the opposite i've taken a notion into my old numb skull observed silver here's the compass there's the tip uh, tip top p point of skeleton island sticking out like a tooth just like a bearing and just like a bearing will you along the line of them bones it was done the body pointed straight in the direction of the island and the compass read duly east southeast and by east i thought so cried the cook and this here is a pointer right up there is our line for the for the pole star and the jolly dollars but by thunder if it don't make me cold inside to think of flint this is one of his jokes and no mistake him and these six was alone here he killed em every man and this one he hauled here and laid down by compass shiver my timbers they're long bones and the hair's been yellow ay that would be uh, allardyce you mind allardyce tom morgan ay ay retor returned morgan i mind him he owed me money he did and took my knife ashore with him speaking of knives said another why don't we find his his lying round flint w weren't the man to pick a seaman pocket and the birds i guess would leave it be by the powers and that's true cried silver 
There ain't a thing left here, said Mary, still feeling round among the bones. Not a copper do it, nor a ba basey box. It don't look natural to me. No, by gum, it don't, agreed Silver. Not natural, nor not nice, says you. Great guns, messmates. But if Flint was living, this would be a hot spot for you and me. Six they were, and six we are, are we, and bones is what they are now. I saw him dead with these here deadlights, said Morgan. Billy took me in. There he laid with penny pieces on his eyes. Dead, aye. Sure enough, he's dead and gone below, said the fellow with the bandage. But if ever spirit walked, it would be it would be Flint's dear heart. But he died bad, did Flint? Aye, that he did. Observed another. Now he raged, and now the hollered for for the rum, and now he hollered for the rum, and now now he sang. Fifteen men were his only song. And I tell you true, I never rightly liked to hear it since. It was main hot and the windy was open and i hear that old song coming out as clear as clear in the death hall on the man already come come said silver stow this talk he's dead and he don't walk that i know leastways he won't walk by day and you may lay to that care killed a cat fetch a head for the doubloons we started certainly but in spite of the hot sun and the staring daylight, the pirates no longer ran separate and shouting through the wood, but kept side by side and spoke with bated breath. The terror of the dead buccaneer had fallen on their spirits. Chapter 32 The Treasure Hunt The Voice Among the Trees Partly from the dampening influence of this alarm, partly to rest silver and the, the sick folk. The whole party sat down as soon as they had gained the brow of the ascent, the plateau being somewhat tilted towards the west. This spot on which we had paused commanded a wide prospect on either hand. Before us, over the treetops, we beheld the cape of the woods fringed with surf. Behind, we not only looked down upon the anchorage in Skeleton Island, but saw, clear across the spit and the eastern lowlands, a great field of open sea upon the east. Sheer above us rose the spyglass, here dotted with simple, single pines, there black with pres precipices. There was no sound but that of the distant breakers, mounting from all around, and the chirp of countless insects in the brush. Not a man, not a sail, upon the sea. The very largeness of the view increased the sense of solitude. Silver, as he sat, took certain bearings with his compass. There are three tall trees, said he, about in the right line from Skeleton Island. Spyglass, shoulder, I take it means that lower point there. It's child's play to find the stuff now. I've half a mind to dine first. I don't feel sharp, growled Morgan. Thinking of Flint, I think it were as done me. Ah, well, my son, you praise your stars he's dead, said Silver. He were an ugly devil, cried a third pirate with a shudder. That blue in the face, too. That was how the rum took him added mary blue well i reckon he was blue that's a true word ever since they had found the skeleton and got upon this train of thought they had spoken lower and lower and they had almost got to whispering by now so that the sound of their talk hardly interrupted the silence of the woods all of a sudden out of the middle of the trees in front of us a thin high trembling voice struck up the well-known air in words fifteen men on the dead man's chest yo ho ho and a bottle of rum i never have seen men more dreadfully affected than the than the pirates 
The color went from their six faces like enchantment. Some leaped to their feet, some clawed hold of others. Morgan groveled on the ground. It's Flint, by, cried Mary. The song had stopped as suddenly as it began, broken off, you would have said, in the middle of a note, as though someone had laid his hand upon the singer's mouth, coming through the clear, sunny atmosphere. Among the green treetops, I thought it had sounded airily and sweetly, and the effect on my co companions was the stranger. Come, said Silver, struggling with his ashen lips to get the word out. This won't do. Stand by to go about. This is a, this is a rum start, and I can't name the voice, but it's someone skylarking. Someone that's flesh and blood, and you may lay to that. His courage had come back as he spoke, and some of the color to his face along with it. Already the others had begun to lend an ear to his encouragement, and were coming a little to themselves. When the same voice broke out again, not this time singing, but in a faint distant hail that echoed yet fainter among the clefts of the spyglass. Darby McGraw, it wailed, for that is the word that best describes the sound. Darby McGraw, Darby McGraw, again and again and again, and then rising a little higher and with an oath that I leave out. Fetch off the, the rum, Darby. The buccaneers remain rooted to the ground, their eyes starting from, from their heads. Long after the voice had died away, they still stared in silence, dreadfully, before them. That fixes it, gasped one. Let's go. They was the last words, moaned Gro Morgan. His last words above board. Dick had his Bible out and was praying valuable, valuably. He had been well brought up, had Dick before he came to see and fell among bad companions. Still, Silver was unconquered. I could hear his teeth rattle in his head, but he had not yet surrendered. Nobody in this here island ever th ever heard of Darby, he muttered. Not one but us that's he not one but us that's here. And then, making a great effort, Shipmates, he cried. I'm here to get that stuff, and I'll not be beat by man or devil. I never was feared of Flint in his life, and, by the powers, I'll face him dead. There's seven hundred thousand pounds, not a quarter of a mile from here. When did ever a gentleman of fortune show his stern to that much dollars for a boozy old seaman with a blue mug, and him dead, too? But there was no sign of reawakening courage in his followers, rather, indeed, of growing terror at the irreverence of his words. "'Belay there, John,' said Mary. "'Don't you cross a spirit!' And the rest were all too terrified to reply. They would have run away se severely had they dared, but fear kept them together, and kept them close by John, as if his daring helped them. He, on his part, had pretty well fought his weakness down. Spirit, well, maybe, he said, but there's one thing not clear to me. There was an echo. Now, no man ever seen a spirit with a shadow. Well, then, what's he doing with an echo to him? I should like to know. That ain't in nature, surely. This argument seemed weak enough to me, but you can never tell what will affect the superstitious, and to my wonder, George Mary was greatly relieved. Well, that's so, he said. You've a head upon your shoulders, John, and no mistake. Bout ship, bout ship, mates. This here crew is on a wrong, wrong tack, I do believe. And come to think of it, it was like Flint's voice, I grant you, but not just so clear a way like it, after all. It was liker somebody else's voice now. It was liker, by the powers, Ben Gunn roared silver ay and so it were cried morgan springing to his knees been gun it were it don't make much odds do it now asked dick been gun's not here in the in the body any more in flint 
but the older hands greeted this remark with scorn. Why, nobody minds Ben Gunn, cried Mary. Dead or alive, nobody minds him. It was extraordinary how their spirits had returned and how the natural color had relieved, revived in their faces. Soon they were chatting together with intervals of listening, and not long after, hearing no further sound, they shouldered their tools and set forth again. Mary was walking first with Silver's compass to keep them on the right line with Skeleton Island. He had said the truth. Dead or alive, nobody minded Ben Gunn. Dick alone still held his Bible and looked around him as he went, with fearful glances, but he found no sympathy, and Silver even joked him on his precautions. I told you, said he, I told you you had, you had spoiled your Bible. If it ain't no good to swear by, what do you suppose a spirit would give, give for it? <laughs> Not that. And he snapped his big fingers, halting a moment on his crutch. But Dick was not to be com comforted. Indeed, it was soon plain to me that the lad was falling sick, hastened by heat, exhaustion, and the shock of his alarm, the fever, predicted by Dr. Livesey, was evidently growing swiftly higher. It was fine, open walking here upon the summit. Our way lay, lay a little downhill, for, as I have said, the plateau tilted towards the west. The pines, great and small, grew wide apart, and even between the clumps of nutmeg and azalea, wide open spaces baked in the hot sun sunshine, striking as we, we did, pretty near northwest across the island. We drew, on the one hand, ever nearer under the shoulders of the spyglass, and on the other, looked even wider over the western bay where I had once tossed and trembled in the oracle. The first of the tall trees was reached and by the bearings proved uh, and by the bearings proved the wrong one. So with the second uh, so with the second, the third rose nearly two hundred feet into the air with a clump of underwood, a giant of a vegetable, with a red column as big as a cottage, at a wide shadow around in which a company could have maneuvered. It was conspicu conspic conspicuous far to see, both on the east and west, and might have been entered as a sailing mark upon the chart. But it was not its size and now that now impressed my companions. It was the knowledge that 700,000 pounds in gold lay somewhere buried below its spreading shadow. The thought of the money, as they drew nearer, swallowed up their previous terrors. Their eyes burned in their, in their heads. Their feet grew speedier and lighter. Their whole soul was found up in that fortune, that whole lifetime of extravagance and pleasure that lay waiting there for each of them. Silver hobbled, grunting on his crutch. His nostrils stood out and, qua and quivered. He cursed like a madman with, when the flies settled on his hot and shiny countenance. He plucked furiously at the line that held me to him and, and from time to time turned his eyes upon me with a deadly look. Certainly, he took no pains to hide his thoughts, and certainly I read them like, paint, like print. In the immediate nearness of the gold, all else had been forgotten. His promise and the doctor's warning were both things of the past, and I could not doubt that he hoped to seize upon the treasure. Find and board the Hispaniola under cover of night, cut every honest throat about that island, and sail away as he had at first intended, laden with crimes and riches. Shaken as I was with these alarms, I was hard, it was hard for me to keep up with the rapid pace of the treasure hunters. Now and again I stumbled, and it was then that Silver plucked so roughly at the rope and launched at me his murderous glances. Dick, who had dropped behind us and now brought, brought up the rear, was babbling to himself both prayers and curses as his fever kept rising. 
This also added to my wretch- wretchedness. And to crown all, I was haunted by the thought of the tragedy that had once been acted on, on that plateau. When that ungodly buccaneer with the blue face, who he who died at Savannah, singing and shouting for drink, had there with his own hand cut down his six accomplices. This grove that was now so peaceful must then have rung with cries, I thought, and even with the thought I could believe I heard it ringing still. We were now at the margin of the thicket. Huzzah, mates, all together, shouted Mary, and the foremost broke into a run. And suddenly, not ten yards further, we beheld, beheld them stop. A low cry arose. Silver doubled his pace, digging away with the foot of his crutch like one possessed. And next moment, he and I had come also to a dead halt. Before us was a great excavation, not very recent, for the sides had fallen in and grass had sprouted on the bottom. In this were the shaft of a pick broken in two, and the boards of several packing cases strewn around. On one of these boards I saw, branded with a hot iron, the name Walrus, the name of Flint's ship. All was clear to pro- probation. The cash had been found and rifled. The 700,000 pounds were gone. And that's where we will end today. Um, next week, we will be finishing the book. Um, so, we'll see you then. <laughs>